I mean, that, Ganesh, those are great points. You know, and, and again, I think the one point that I think the viewers really need to come to come to grips with is that it's not necessarily, as you said, just diagnosing prostate cancer. It's trying to diagnose aggressive prostate cancer and basically if you can find that the, obviously those would be the targets that need to be treated obviously we can get into this whole discussion is Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer and, and then obviously you know using biomolecular markers and probably using them in conjunction with this new multi-parametric MRI mm -hmm. fusion biopsy program you know will also be uh, very valuable so Again, I think, Neil, uh, you know, getting back to this concept of, of again, there's buckets, who, who, who to biopsy. But then also, uh, Chris, if, if you have a negative biopsy, and we know that the, the positive predictive value for, for routine ultrasound-guided sexted biopsies is somewhere between 35 and 50 percent, if you have a negative biopsy, obviously, is it, is it sampling error, knowing the fact that we completely undersample the prostate gland with our traditional ultrasound guided biopsies. But if you have that patient who has suspicious features, PSA continues to rise, uh, what tests are out there to determine who might require a re-biopsy given certain clinical parameters? You know, I think that the paradigm is changing a lot on this. When I have done my biopsies in the past, I would tell my patients I'd come in and discuss the results with them. Now I'm telling them that I'll discuss the results with you, and if they're negative, we have to do something else, which is something that I've been doing just in the last month or two. And you never want to wish ill will on a patient, but if you have a high-grade prostate biopsy that's positive, it's sort of an easy discussion. We kind of know what to do with it. We've been doing that for 10 or 15 years. I think the answer to your question is there's a whole bucket of other sort of genetic testings about who to repeat a biopsy on. Um, one of one is, a con is the Confirm MDX study. Uh, Confirm MDX is, sort of looks at methylation. Methylation is a marker for aggressiveness, and that's a tool that could be used after a biopsy. The thought process is that there might be a tumor that's present, and if the biopsy needle maybe misses it on one side and misses it on the other side, that you could look at some of the genetic aberrations in methylation to see if there's a halo effect or the possibility of aggressiveness there, and that might be a tool to use. I've, I've used that a couple times. Um, there's the TMPRSS2 ERG gene fusion assay, which is essentially a transmembrane protease. It's a, it's a marker of overall cell growth. Um, that's something that has really, was originally developed by Hologic, and now I think Metamark is marketing that test. That's another thing that could be used to try and, uh, there's certain cutoffs that can be used to try and suggest who should have a repeat biopsy or not. Um, there's the prostate core mitomomic test, which is really interesting in its concept because they're looking at mitochondrial DNA with that. That's really novel amongst all the other biomarkers because we think that mitochondrial DNA is a different kind of tool to look at. And essentially, we think that there might be true negative when a biopsy is performed on that. If the test is done correctly, you might get a 90% chance that it's a really a negative predictive value. I don't really have a lot of upfront experience with that, but I've seen that that seems to be an interesting tool. There's the Promark proteomic-based imaging test, which is something that can also be used to separate really favorable from unfavorable pathology. And the last thing we should talk about is the P10 gene status. And what we know about, uh, about P10 is it's a tumor suppressor, and, and that's present in probably about 60% of tumor cells. So, you know, the, the, the presence or absence of, of, of P10 might suggest to you that the, there's a higher likelihood that there would be cancer present. And that's more often used in other, um, you know, cancers of different types than prostate cancer. So I think in a nutshell, it's <laughs> there's a lot of stuff there. And to the average practicing clinician, it's going to be with time that will validate what the appropriate test is. And I think a lot of that is based on who's got the most money to market to individual clinicians. You know, some of these tests that I'm not as familiar with, it's because there's not a local rep and not trying to sell it to us. I think that we've seen that some of the other particular assays have more of a sales force and they're really kind of in there and saying, do this, do this, reflects the test. And it, I, I will say it's a confusing point in time for it, but somewhere in these is gonna shake out what we do. You're not gonna do all five tests on every patient. And I think, as, as Ganesh alluded to, A number one, many of these, many of these tests um, really do not have a lot of large-scale validated trials. And we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later, but clearly the biggest challenge for these, given the fact that many of them are tissue-based, I mean, these are expensive tests. And ultimately, they're going to have to show clinical utility. And we're going to talk a little bit later on about the clinical utility trials, um, why people are looking at this uh, specifically 
uh, discussing Elaine Jeter's mold, uh, molecular diagnosis program, her Moldex program. So.